So I'm Ting Ting uh, from Excel Scientific Singapore. So thank you for joining us today. We have Kevin here as well from Ethical Scientific Malaysia. Hello, and we everyone. also have Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> we have Nicole and Kali here from Azure Biosystems who will be giving the presentation today. So uh, yep. So I'm Nicole and Kali, do you want to say hi? <laughs> Yeah, hi. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm Nicole from Azure Biosystem. Thanks for joining us today. And I hope you have a fun learning throughout the whole workshop. Thank you. Yeah, so for today's webinar uh, workshop, basically, we will be introducing what is Western blot to you guys. Uh, so basically, there are uh, a few different types of Western blotting methods. So we will highlight that today and also how it's applicable to your research. Yep. So if there are any questions, please feel free to put it in the questions box. Uh, or you can message uh, any of us uh, organizers directly and we will answer it for you. Uh, yep. So at this moment, it's almost 3 p.m. Kaiding, do you want to give a intro and start? Uh, I thought Kevin want to intro introduce himself first. Yeah. Ah. yeah. <laughs> so hi, yeah. everyone. Okay. Yeah, I'm Kevin Avinash. So I'm in charge of the equipment sales from uh, Epical Scientific. So there'll be two, I mean, uh, I'm from Malaysia and Ting Ting is from Singapore. So we are both in charge from different countries dealing with the distribution of Azure Biosystems. And uh, we would like to thank you for joining this uh, workshop. We hope you know, this will be a very fruitful workshop uh, e-learning experience that you guys will uh, go through. And like Ting Ting said, any questions, uh, any uh, uh, comments that you have, please just uh, type it down in the chat or the questions and we'll definitely uh, help you out. Yeah, passing over to Dr. Kai. Oh, yeah. Uh, remember you want to say it about the certificate of attendance? Uh, yeah, okay. So one more thing I forgot to mention is for all those who actually participated in this workshop, there will be three series of uh, e-learning workshop. So if you guys uh, participate and register for all three and complete these three CDs, we will actually give you a uh, certificate of uh, attendance where uh, each of every one of you will get it. But upon completion of th all these three workshops, yeah? Right, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Ting Ting and Nicole. Right, so uh, hello everyone, I am Kai Ling. Right, so before I start, let me check, uh, do a sound check or mic check. If you can hear my voice clearly, it's not my fault. Uh, feel free to type yes in the chat box. I believe it will direct you to the pool, uh, the question, but it's okay. Just let me know that you can hear my voice clearly. All right. Okay, so can you see the screen as well? Okay, yes. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so let me introduce myself. I am Kai Ling, the Regional Field Application Scientist of Azure Biosystems. Welcome, everyone, today to the first session of Western Blot e-learning workshop. This is a workshop consists of three sessions. Today, the first session, we will go through the introduction to Western Blot, where we will talk about the principles of chemiluminescence Western Blotting, antibody detection with chemiluminescence and fluorescence method. Thirdly, we go through imaging Western blot and finally, the normalization of your Western blot. So these are the agendas for today's session. Feel free to, uh, just like they say, feel free to type any question down in the chat box and we will answer it uh, in the Q&A session after this uh, presentation. Right, so before we start, let me introduce Azure Biosystems to you. We are a United States, a United States based company in the California, very right near to Silicon Valley. We are a team of highly experienced scientists and engineers and also entrepreneurs dedicated to accelerate your science by innovating in unexpected places. So we create products that combine smart and simple workflow with high performance and affordability. So the result is that you can have the confidence in your data to move forward quickly and the flexible capabilities to go everywhere the data takes you. Our mission is to give you the raw data that you can rely on 
using simple workflows that you can trust. Our company is founded by Aono Shifji and Dr. Diping Che. Aono is our CEO, a venture investor and entrepreneur, while Dr. Diping is our executive VP of R&D. So you can see that he has a lot of experience back in Illumina and also Alpha Inotech, which is a brand that we're quite familiar of, right? So our core members of Azuba Systems is including Dr. Diping, are coming from Alpha Inotech, which then acquired by Cell Biosciences and become Protein Simple today. This company founded in 2013 is a very, very new company. With uh, this, uh, you can see across the timeline, we have a few key instruments that we, rele we release throughout the years. So we have our C-series, the first CCD uh, camera imager, combining LED and laser-based excitation light source, which then replace by the new Azu Imaging System back in 2019. We've upgraded camera software and uh, better hardware as well. And we have two, we have the highest spec in our uh, portfolio, which is the, a Sapphire Biomolecular Imager, which is the first hybrid CCD Imager and laser scanning system. And last year, we released the QPCR system called Azul Cielo Real-Time PCR System. So you can see that our name, Azul, is uh, mean blue in Spanish. Thus, our name has been consists of Sapphire, it means blue, and also Cielo, it means blue as well. So this is how you recognize us. Okay, let us go straight to the workshop content. Last year, the year of 2020, is the 40th years of Western plotting. So this figure is taken from the Journal of Proteomics, published back in 2020, last year. So it shows the proportion of five different techniques in all protein-related publication, estimated by the number of PubMed mentioned in text word and title. As you can see, although the percentage of Western blot mentioned in the title has been decreasing across the years, but it is consistently higher in proportions when compared to other techniques. This shows that Western blot is the essential and widely used analytical technique in protein studies. Western blotting is universal. The, there are two questions you need to ask yourself while you will run a Western blot. Do you have a qualitative or quantitative protein expression question. Qualitative means you just want to know yeah, uh, whether there is yes or no, the presence of essence of protein of interest. Or quantitative means you just want to relatively quantitate or comparing two different or more than two groups and accurately measure the changes in protein expression. This is a simply flight a simplified flowchart of Western blotting workflow. So it starts with gel electrophoresis, transfer step, blocking, primary antibody, then divide, divided into two major antibody detection, which is chemiluminescence detection and also fluorescence detection, and finally imaging and analysis. I'll go into the principles of each of these steps in the later slide. First, electrophoresis. This is a step where we will physically separating the proteins from one and another across a gel matrix with gel electrophoresis. A protein sample is mixed with a loading buffer, loaded into a gel, then subjected into an electrical current, which is applied to the gel buffer system. In terms of gel, so we have a different type of gels here. The universal one will be SCS page gel. The it, capable of resolving the proteins based on the molecular weight, and this is determined by the gel pore size. We have lemly discontinuous gel, where you have stacking gel on top of resolving gel for you to get a sharper and more defined bands. 
And then we also have the commercially available gradient gel, such as 4% to 15% gel, gradient gel, for you to resolve for multiple proteins that span a wide range of molecular weight. The resolving capabilities of these gels is determined by gel pore size, which is governed by, by the concentration of acrylamide and also the concentration of these acrylamide cross linker. So in general, the higher percentage the gel have, the smaller the pore size it has. And then it used to separate protein with a lower molecular weight. As we talk about gel, we need the buffer system. So in SDS page standard gel, we use alkaline buffer tree glycine for mid-size protein resolution. Right, so this is a gel electrophoresis step. Next, after you've done the gel electrophoresis, so we move to transfer step. So this is a part where the proteins are separated in gel electrophoresis according to the molecular weight. You want to transfer this protein, separate the protein to a solid membrane. So it will support for your subsequent vessel blotting steps. There are two types of membrane you can use in this step. Firstly, nitrocellulose membrane. Secondly, PVDF membrane. Nitrocellulose is much more cost effective. It is much cheaper than PVDF. It gives you low background for chemiluminescence detection. It doesn't need activation uh, like what you need in PVDF membrane, but it is rather fragile and it cannot be used if you're doing fluorescent detection method. PVDF, on the other hand, is much more durable. It is suitable for both chemi and fluorescent detection. You need methanol to activate it before you use. If you're doing fluorescent resin, it's best to use low fluorescent PVDF membrane. So you have a choice of either nitrocellulose or PVDF membrane in the transfer step. There are also two different transfer setup you can use. A wet transfer setup or a semi-dry transfer setup. And let's look at them closely. What it means by wet transfer? This is what we call as a transfer sandwich. So you sandwich up the membrane, the gel, and the filter paper that is soaked with the transfer buffer. So wet transfer means you insert this sandwich into a tank full of the transfer buffer and then do and then subject it to electrical current over time. Semi-dry means this is the sandwich is pre-wet. It remain moist at all time during the whole transfer, but it is not soaked in a tank filled with buffer. It just lie on top of, a, I would say, a plate, a platform, so you can squeeze them and then do a semi-dry transfer. Now let's look at the advantages and drawbacks of these two setup. A wet transfer is very flexible. You can adjust the transfer condition very easily in terms of the time and, and the voltage and the watt as well. And then you can do uh, different types of transfer buffer. So soak it at different types of transfer buffer to optimize your transfer, like based on the molecular weight of protein of interest. And this method supports the transfer of a broader molecular weight range at one time and then it is also compatible with extended transfer time for a large molecular weight. The reason is you need to transfer a large molecular weight out of the gel into onto a membrane. It takes time for the for the protein to squeeze through the gel pores and then adhere it on itself on the membrane. Thus, you need either higher voltage or longer time. This method is the best for quantitative resin. However, it comes with several drawbacks as well. Because of the longer time, transfer time, the buffer can be heated up. So it is best if you have some cooling method or insert some cool block or keep it in a cold room during the whole transfer process. And also, uh, the, one of the drawbacks is you need a large volume of transfer buffer in this setup. 
For semi-dry transfer, on the other hand, this is a rapid transfer. It uses higher electrical current. And you can use this continuous buffer system to optimize the transfer of the proteins. For example, one side of the filter membrane can be soaked with a buffer that is better for short, uh, for lower molecular weight transfer, for example. Okay, so as compared to wet transfer, you don't need a whole tank of transfer buffer. So little buffer is required. It's easier to set up and it is good if you want to transfer a lot of blood at the same time that you analyze for the same protein. But the idea is because it uses high intensity field strength, it may cause the low molecular weight protein to migrate past through the membrane. And it is quite difficult in transferring high molecular weight for those, especially for those at higher than 120 kilodalton. This method is not recommended for quantitative resin because um, a lot of reasons uh, for that. And mostly because the protein, you lose the protein is not very controlled in that way. And this method, you, you might having a risk that the gel can dry out. Right, next let us move to the component of transfer buffer. So you have a buffer, which is either trees, cap or carbonite, alcohol, methanol, ethanol, to increase the binding of proteins to the membrane, detergent, SDS, to promote the migration of proteins out of the gel, and also trees, tricine, to separate the lower molecular weight from the free SDS. So in terms of transfer, the time and the voltage setting should be optimized for each of the transfer. We know that uh, we try to control each of these steps like using the same steps all the time. But things might not go in that way because there's a lot of reasons that affecting your Western blotting, for example, weather, ambient temperature, even the, the preparation of the buffer, the buffer concentration. There's a lot of variables here. So it's, it's best that you optimize the transfer time and voltage for each of these transfer. So in general, Longer transfer time with a lower current is used in the wet transfer. And in semi-dry transfer, it is faster because it uses a high current. While the, trans when the proteins are generally transferred at a more rapidly at a higher voltage, the transfer efficiency is not always consistent. In that sufficient current and or time may result in incomplete transfer while the higher current or a very long transfer time may result in loss of protein via transfer through the membrane without retention. So this, in this means that you have to optimize the transfer time and voltage for your experiment. After we transfer the protein from the gel onto a membrane, next we need to block the membrane. The blocking step is aimed to remove non-specific bindings of antibodies that can result in high background signals when the blood is imaged, just in reducing, it will reduce the detection sensitivity. How we do it is you incubate the membrane in a blocking solution after the transfer step. In order to prepare the blocking solution, you can use buffered salt solutions such as trees, TBS or PBS. Bear in mind if you use PBS because it can interfere with alkaline phosphatase-based detection methods or if you're trying to detect any phosphor-specific um, proteins. You will need to use detergent also in the membrane, in the blocking solution. Um, a low concentration of mild non-ionic detergent such as Twin20 is recommended to add inside the blocking solution because it can prevent the microbial growth. But please make sure that it will it is completely solubilized to prevent artifacts by the uh, so you don't see the artifacts by the end of imaging steps. If you are doing fluorescence detection method, you shouldn't use any detergent at all in block as a blocking agent. So now we know the solution to prepare the solution used to prepare the blocking buffer a blocking solution, detergent, and next is what kind of blocking agent. 
There are two major types. The first is protein blocking agent, or also protein free blocking agent. Protein blocking agent means you, you have a few options here. The first is non fat dry milk, it is economical, easy to prepare, and it is very efficient. But it is also not suitable for phosphor specific antibodies. You can also use a general serum as a blocking agent. This is less favorable because of its interaction with antibodies that lead to high background noises. BSA or bovine serum albumin is good for phosphorus specific antibodies, but please be wary if you're doing tyrosine phosphorylated protein detection. And you can also it can also not be used together if you're trying to detect anti-lytin antibodies. So these are the protein blocking agent. We also have protein free blocking agent. Here we're talking about water soluble polymer polyvinyl pyridone, which is a commonly used southern block blocking agent, and this can be used in western block as well. Personally, I do not. I I would highly recommend non-fat dry milk because it's very economical, and unless specific. Um, application, for example, you want to detect certain type of proteins, then you might opt for BSA or the protein-free blocking agent. Blocking conditions can be very dependent um, on the time and temperature as well. So, in a general practice, within a room uh, at a room temperature setting, one hour blocking is sufficient. If you want to block for more than two hours, then we recommend you to block at to keep the incubate in the blocking solution for at 4 degrees Celsius, up to 16 hours, I would say. Right, so after the membrane blocking step, next is primary antibody detection, uh, incubation, sorry. So there are two different uh, uh, incubation here, the direct and indirect. Direct antibody, primary antibody means the primary antibody has already labeled with a detected molecule, either labeled with an enzyme or four force that you can straight away recognize an antigen of interest. This is simple, fast, and straightforward. Indirect is a much widely used, much more popular, is more sensitive, and also highly cost effective. Here we have an unlabeled primary antibody and a labeled secondary antibodies, where you will recognize the primary antibody, so this we call indirect detection. In the choice of primary antibody, or secondary antibody, we have two different uh, types of primary antibody, polyclonal, monoclonal. Polyclonal means there's a mix of an individual antibody that recognize a different region of the same antigen. So it offers a wide range of binding specification, but it can also lead to a higher background. Then next is monoclonal antibody. This is an antibody is much more expensive because it uh, it is much more costly to produce. It recognizes the same on the antigen. It uh, gives less robust signal but it is highly specific. So you often not really see um, unspecific bindings in if you're using monoclonal primary antibody. In terms of secondary antibody, there are a few con conditions you need to consider. First thing is species, especially the species uh, of the primary antibody. Let's say your primary antibody is rapid anti gap dh for example. So your secondary antibody must be anti-rabbit secondary antibody, either HRP or for false, um, up to you. So the, the class type of primary antibody also influence the secondary antibody of choice. You can choose based on isotype, the heavy and light chain molecule that make up, makes up the primary antibody, for example, mouse IgG antibody and so on. So in terms of secondary antibody, uh, or primary antibodies, if you're doing direct detection. There are a few of the conjugates. The first thing will be enzymatic label, 
either using alkaline phosphatase or uh, HRP for chemiluminescence detection. Fluorescent label will, will be using for false for fluorescent detection. And there are other options as well, such as biotin labeled for sensitive detection of low abundance proteins. Well, let us look at the flow workflow again. So we have talked about the principles of electrophoresis, transfer, block, then incubation of primary antibody or secondary antibody, I'll say. Then let us move into the next step, which is the antibody detection. Antibody detection with chemiluminescence and fluorescence method. Chemiluminescence is a popular indirect detection method for Western blot that relies on enzyme and substrate reaction that emits light. Okay, this is very good for one signal and detecting one protein. In the chemiluminescence detection, the antigen primary antibody complex is bound by a secondary antibody that conjugate with an enzyme. Here will be HRP or alkaline phosphatase. Then the enzyme will catalyze a reaction with the substrate that generate the light in the presence of the substrate, a luminescent substrate or luminol, I would say. And the light can be detected either by X-ray film or CCD-based imaging system. The choice of the of this reaction, I'll say the substrate, is can commercially available and it allows you to detect up to a femtogram range. Historically, a chemiluminescent western blot is done on via the exposure of the blot to an X-ray film. It can only can uh, you can also do it on CCD based camera as well. Right. Then this is due to the enzymatic nature of chemiluminescence reaction, the band or signal intensity increases greatly over time. And this can be quite problematic for highly abundant proteins because normally the signal will saturate the detector. In that we need to be careful on the ECL substrate that we use because chemiluminescence is heavily dependent on substrate and concentration, enzyme quantity, temperature, pH, and so on and so forth. Here's a comparison of four different ECL substrates on the market. So we have Amersham ECL, a more sensitive ECL plus, super signal, and also radiance from Azuba systems. So one key note here is to quantitate Western blot accurately, the band signal we get must be proportional to the protein amount. So this is what we call as signal linearity. So how much, how intense the signal it is, the, the higher the protein you have. Right. So let us look at the graph here. All of these ECL substrates has very have very good signal linearity, but some of them are not longer linear after uh, if it's detecting above a thousand picogram of protein loads, such as the substrate indicated by square boxes or triangular. So what we say is these signals are falls off the signal linearity and they are not longer qualified for quantitation because it is not longer representing the actual protein amount because you can see here we wanted it to be a signal to be linear so the higher the signal it is the more protein you expected to get right let us look at the advantages and disadvantages of this chemiluminescent detection method Chemiluminescence is very specific, it's very sensitive, easy to perform, sensitive, it can detect up to femtogram levels, and this technique is uh, it compatible with film or digital imaging as well. This technique is very good at answering the question, is my protein there or not? Because it's good for a single protein detection. Is there or not? You can see it.
But it is not so good in addressing questions such as how much of my protein is present related to the other protein, or how do I control the sample loading consistency across different blood, for example. The reason of this is chemiluminescence reaction, it emits light over a broad range of wavelengths. It's a chemiluminescence anyway. So it cannot distinguish a signal from different proteins. Instead, so the proteins must be well resolved in the back in the gel electrophoresis step. Especially, you need to separate the control from your protein of interest. Or else, these bands will most likely be overlapping. Or you want, may want to choose a different housekeeping protein, for example. And these overlapping bands can also impact the detection of normalization and loading controls. So unless your control or your housekeeping are well resolved, electrophoretically from the protein of interest, you need to do, you need to strip and report the blot to detect the control, which makes the blot is not longer quantitative because we know that there's a risk or there's, there's evidence telling us that the strip and report process do remove a certain amount of protein on the membrane itself. Or you can do another way is you can make, you can detecting the housekeeping or the controls at the separate block. But this is also not longer making it a true loading control as well, because the loading in two different gel might be different, even though it's operate from the same personnel. So all in all, the inherent variability of this enzymatic uh, enzyme substrate reaction makes chemiluminescence at best a semi-quantitative detection chemistry. All right, so it, because it's highly dependent on the enzyme, it can only detect one single protein. At the same time, it's very hard to differentiate two different proteins. So finally, if you're using X-ray film, it suffers from the limitations, uh, limited dynamic range that will always often lead to signal saturation. But don't get me wrong, chemiluminescence is good. It is very good, it's still used today, uh, widely used today, especially in detecting low abundance of protein, okay, up until today, especially together with X-ray film detection. Right, next, let us move to fluorescence by some blood detection. Fluorescence by some uh, allows you to do multiplex detection. It uses two or more fluorescent dye, and an instrument that can excite and detect the dye from the light from each dye. So you can use two primary antibodies that can probe for two separate protein of interest. And then each of these secondary antibodies can be labeled with different 404s. And these 404, these two 404s, have different or distinct excitation and emission spectra. Multiplexing is very good is for faster and more efficient study, right? So there's a term here, what we call a spectral separation. Spectral separation means the different wavelength between the excitation and emission wavelength, and also spectral separation between two different fluorophores, thus allowing you to detect up more than one um, antibody or protein on the same blood. So this is one of the biggest advantages in fluorescent western versus the chemiluminescence is ability to use more than one antibody per assay. And we it usually visualize use, using a digital imager rather than extra film. The newer generation of imaging system often contain more sophisticated camera that exhibit a broader dynamic range than film, thus avoiding the signal saturation problem that limits the dynamic range of X-ray film. Right, then let, uh, next we have talked about signal linearity back in the chemiluminescence. Now let us look at how fluorescence do. In terms of signal linearity, fluorescence uh, offer stable and linear light production because they are not enzyme like HRP. They are signal, they are linear, 
This is very essential, essential for quantitative resin because when the amount of protein lysate increases, the frozen signals also increases. So giving you the best linear fit than chemiluminescence, thus giving you higher quantitation power. With multiplexing, let us look at the advantages and drawbacks. You can visualize both your loading controls, or housekeeping, and also your protein of interest at the same time on the same plot as the sample. And you also, you can use different type of profiles, allow you to visualize proteins that are reside on the similar molecular weight. For example, for post-translational modification uh, studies, uh, let's say I want to detect total step one protein and phosphorylated step one protein. They are not different in terms of molecular weight. So it is hard to detect two at the same time. You either do strip and report. But this can be resolved by using fluorescence detection method. You just need to image them at different channels. You don't need to do strip and report process. Right. Thus, um, right. Then next is Unlike the chemiluminescence western, which is limited by the kinetics of enzymatic substrate reaction, the amount of light emitted for fluorophores is highly consistent and directly proportional to the amount of proteins on the membrane, as you can see here. When there's high protein uh, abundance, the signal will be high. The band intensity will be increased. This is linear as contrast, we contrast with the chemiluminescence signals. And this consistency means that the frozen detection can provide truly quantitative analysis of the proteins in question. Okay, finally, the advantages of uh, one of the advantages of frozen western is frozen label is stable. It allows you to store the blot for a longer time and image it months after the initial experiment, as long as the precautions are taken to avoid photo bleaching of the profiles. Right. So while frozen detection is the best choice for quantitation and also qualitative detection, and also it can greatly accelerate your workflow for analyzing multiple proteins uh, via resin blotting on the same blot, it has a few drawbacks as well. Firstly, it is less sensitive than chemiluminescence. This is, uh, this is for sure. Uh, depending on the proteins that you said, it is less sensitive. Uh, we know that it's up to one picogram, okay, for fluorescence. And for chemiluminescence, you can detect up to femtogram range. For fluorescence detection, there are a few things you need to be careful is the reagent and membrane. It can give you auto uh, signals that will increase the backgrounds of the image later. And finally, you also need a digital imager to detect fluorescence uh, signal as well. In terms of time taken, this is our in-house, um, I'll say in-house, in-house uh, experiment comparing the time taken between two chemiluminescence and fluorescence detection methods. We do realize that it takes lesser time to do uh, fluorescence by some as compared to chemi, especially if you if you count into the for primary antibody incubation, they often incubate in overnight in four degree. It will greatly reduce the res overall resin blotting time uh, down to three hours if you do fluorescent western. We also look at the cost of the fluorescence between fluorescence and chemiluminescence detection. So we have here. Uh, chemiluminescent using film or chemiluminescent using CCD and also fluorescent using uh, fluorescent imaging system. The cost is um, uh, in fluorescent uh, resins is of course the most expensive one would be the antibodies because it's fluorescent antibody anyway. But if you count into the consumables and also the um, ECL, the extra films that use in the chemiluminescence resins, is actually cheaper if you do fluorescent western in the long run. If you're interested, you can do the math yourself later today, comparing the price of fluorescence and the, and the body, the dilution you need to use, count 
the cost you need to do for each of the plot and the time taken. You see that in the long run, or not to say in the long run, but fluorescence itself is much more cost efficient than chemiluminescence. Right, so both chemiluminescence and fluorescence detection are excellent methods. There's, there's no one that is actually better than the others. They are applicable for specific applications. And you can, when you use it together, it can provide complementary information that enhances your insight in your research. So the lab shouldn't be say like, oh, I'm a chemiluminescence Western lab or a fluorescent Western lab. So a lab that uses the best assay for each experiment will be the best. This table outlines when to use a chemiluminescence and when to use a fluorescent detection. The chemiluminescence has been established and integrated in many labs globally due to the traditional use of film and high sensitive. It is very good to detect a single protein, or if you just want to check the absence or presence of a protein, or if you just want to measure, uh, measure antibody response without, you know, not really quantitative uh, doing it, and or you just want to check the protein uh, protein concentration after the purification, or finally, one of the biggest advantages of chemiluminescence, if, if you want to detect low abundance protein, then you need to go for chemiluminescence. For fluorescence, it is best if you want to detect multiple proteins simultaneously on the same blood. It saves your time, you know, stream and report, risking the quantitative power. It is good if you, it is best if you study post-translational modification and if you want to quantitate the same blood loading control and checking the in-lane normalization. And finally, this is the best method for you to do if you want to perform quantitative lesson comparing multiple groups, okay? So all these advantages, or I would say the perks, are due to the nature of their reaction or the light itself. So like chemiluminescence is limited by the enzymatic reaction. Well, fluorescence is not limited by that, but it's rather limited by the imaging system or the other hardware limitation, I would say. Right. So this will be very um, important if you to consider which way you to go. I will summarize it into this uh, figure. Once you make the decision to uh, between chemiluminescence and fluorescence, there are a few questions you need to ask. For us, firstly, do you have access to a digital imager? If you do not have digital imager, then you need to go for chemiluminescence because you'll be using extra film. And do you have, do you anticipate very low protein uh, level? Yes, then you need to go for chemiluminescence. But if you need to detect multiple proteins at the same plot, um, especially if they're doing, they are at similar sizes, and you need precise quantification, okay, quantitation, okay, then you need to go for fluorescence western. You can, you can also um, mix together, for example, you just want to detect protein of interest, is there or not, then you go for chemi, okay? Then you want to quantitate, you go for fluorescence easiest. So this is a question you need to ask before you do your, you choose your Western detection method. After we'll be imaging the Western blot. Traditionally, Western blot, chemiluminescence especially, has been uh, imaged with X-ray film. So there's one concept here. Every detector has their own intrinsic, intrinsic dynamic range. The, we, we keep talking about dynamic, dynamic range. Dynamic range here means the ability to capture both very low and very high signal intensity in the same image without any saturation. So we X-ray film has give you very low optical density. A 1 to 1.5, so it's, it's very easy to get saturated, but it is super good to detect very low abundance of protein expression. 
But for, for, for routine Western blotting, I would say digital imaging will be the solution to count to solve the dynamic range limitation of film because it has higher optical density with a very linear uh, signal uh, intense uh, linear as well dynamic range I would say. So let me, let me talk about CCD camera in digital imager for chemiluminescent western. There's not all CCD chips are the same. What does it really mean about CCD chips? So the size of the CCD means how much the electron can actually hold in the pixel well. In short, the definition of a dynamic range of a CCD means the full well capacity divided by the camera noise and related to the ability of a camera to record simultaneously very low signal alongside with the bright signals. Full well capacity is the maximum number of electrons that register a signal in a pixel. So the larger pixel has have larger well capacity which also leads to higher sensitivity, better signal to noise ratio and increased dynamic range. So when a charge in a pixel exceed the saturation level, okay, there's too much electron to be registered in that particular pixel. You can see that the camera start to deviate from the linear response, okay. The electron will keep filling up on the same pixels that's why you see the over-saturation uh, over or overexpose. So it will not longer linear, compromising the quantitative performance of the camera. So if they, let's say there's another CCD chips that has a bigger or larger pixel well cap, I'll say, so it will not saturate. Even though there's, these are the same blot, it will not saturate at all. It will still give you the linear, you, you can still count it because in a normal practice, Western blot, if you see an uh, image that is oversaturated, we normally don't use it for quantitation. We're not using it for analysis at all. Okay, you would choose the exposure time which is lesser, so you won't get an oversaturated um, image. Right, so here will be uh, for the fluorescence Western. So there are two different excitation light source for fluorescence. We have LED and laser. LED is very broad. It's a broadband light source, giving you relatively low energy output, power output with diffused light. It is comes with economical price, but it also has a comes with a risk of light leakage, which gives you higher background noises. For laser excitation light source, it is monochromatic. You can see that it's higher power output, high energy collimated light. Of course, it gives you premium uh, performance with premium price as well. Right. So here we we'll say the laser diode offers less background, less light leakage, mostly no. So it gives you more sensitivity in shorter time. If you're doing fluorescence western, there will be a few uh, profiles or signals that you need to be considered. So they are, we can divide the fluorescence signal into two big categories. A visible RGB fluorescence, uh, like blue, green, red, side 2, side 3, and side 5. Also, near infrared signals at 700 nanometer wavelength and above. So, these are the comparison between RGB and near infrared fluorescence. RGB, you can do up to three multiplex, a wide dial application, dye choices, but uh, it also has higher membrane and sample auto fluorescence and give you high background noises is lesser sensitive, less sensitive than the near infrared. Near infrared, on the other hand, you can do up to two multiplex, but of course, uh, as compared to RGB, you have lesser dye choices due to the technology of the dye right now. And low, but it, has, it is good because in terms of the excitation light source and the detection, you will, you will normally get a lower background noises in the near infrared range and also higher sensitivity. So if you're doing fluorescent western, the type of membrane, excitation light source, and also the choice or combination of fluorescent dyes are important for accurate western blot quantitation. Right, so we talk about imaging western blot, the 
things you need to be considered about extra film, digital imager, and then also the fluorescent resistance. Next, let us move into normalization of Western blot. There are two major uh, Western blot normalization right now on the scientific community. So if you're doing quantitative Westerns, accurate quantitative comparison requires a very good control, a normalization control. Housekeeping protein is something that is having we've been used many years. It's been routinely used as a loading control. It relies on a single indicator, a single band of the sample loading across the entire membrane. Normally, it is the highly expressed a protein. Okay, so because we expect it to be constant, stable, and highly expressed in all of these samples. So that's why the accuracy of this housekeeping protein in terms of normalization control relies on the stable expression of these housekeeping proteins. But there's a lot of experiment or publication has been telling us that expression of these housekeeping proteins are not really stable. It has been varies based uh, according to the experimental condition, cell type, disease states, drug treatment, and so on and so forth. So the idea is since the housekeeping protein is not longer stable, or uh, if you noticed it in your experiment, then what are the options you can do if you want to normalize your Western blot? You can opt for total protein stains. What total protein stains did is it doesn't rely on a single band though. It used a combined signals from many different proteins band in each of the sample. So there's one, so in housekeeping, there's one band. So total protein stains at a lot of bands. So one versus a lot. Of course, the total protein stains will minimize the error and variability because you're not relying on one single band to give you the normalization factor. Does this method will correct the variation in protein load and also transfer efficiency? You can also use it to monitor protein transfer. However, for total protein stains, the technology right now, because you need to stain all uh, the, the protein, multiple proteins in each lane, it requires specific channels, most, mostly fluorescent channels, to capture the signals. Okay. So with these benefits, the scientific community is starting to favor total protein normalization due to the minimal uh, technical or biological variation. Like I said, housekeeping protein is one. Total protein staining is a lot. So one versus more than one. It's definitely more than one. So of course, um, total protein staining is having a higher stand in this place. Unless you can prove your housekeeping protein has been stable throughout your samples, you know, your experiments, the time point collection, sample collection time point, then I'll say you should opt for total protein stains to give you better quantitation and normalization factor, uh, normalization. Right. So in terms of Western plot normalization, here I will be using a fluorescence uh, image to give you, show you the example. Housekeeping protein normalization means you use a single housekeeping protein, okay, to normalize your chemiluminescence or fluorescent Western. So it can be done by using, let's say here, you have your, let's say you have transferrin in this, and tubulin is your housekeeping. What you did is you divide uh, and, uh, the sample one, divide the, your protein of interest, divided by your housekeeping protein value. So that is how you normalize the, 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 the expression. Then you can compare between different samples, okay? And for total protein normalization, on the other hand, uh, this is different story. You can actually do, um, oh, sorry, back in here. So there's a two method. You can either dividing the value of your protein interest divided by your protein uh, value of your housekeeping protein, or there's another way which is much more accurate is you using a normalization factor or, or say, um, yeah, factor. Means uh, in, this, your, in this quantification, your housekeeping 
14, the value, you assign one as a reference lane, okay, and the rest of the housekeeping value divided by the reference lane, you get a you will get a normalization factor. The normalization factor for each of the lane, you use it to divide your value, the value of your protein of interest. Uh, the, the mathematical calculation, this I'll explain in the session three, which will be the normalization in resin plotting. Right, let us move to total protein normalization. So as you see, there will be multiple protein bands that will be stained in the total protein uh, channel. Okay, so as you can see, we have the we have the graph on the right. Uh, on the right, here you can see the comparing the total protein stain, comparing the actin, you know, tubulin and gap TH. You can see that their R squares are good for the housekeeping proteins are good, but not as good as total protein stain. So here, the total protein stain used in this experiment is azure red, which is our total protein stain in from azure biosystems. Okay, so how we did is there's a serial dilution of the the, the 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 protein lysate. Okay, then we do uh because we want to image everything in the same block, so we don't want to we don't want to have the risk of losing any of the signal linearity. Those we're using fluorescent resistance. But then you compare all this signal linearity across the dilution, then you see that uh, the when the signal increases, total protein stain was still giving you the best signal linearity comparing to the housekeeping uh, proteins. Okay, this is not a um, this is not a treated sample. This is just a increasing concentration of HeLa cell lysate. So imagine that if you have different experimental group, you know, collected different time points and so on and so forth, cell type, organ, these variations of your housekeeping protein is even larger. So thus I will encourage you to kind of trans, trans, transit, trans, uh, transition from housekeeping protein to total protein stains for better quantitation, okay, on normalization. Right, so uh, okay, so let's recap what we have talked about today in this workshop before we move into the Q and A session. We have active discussion. We have talked about the principles of chemiluminescence resin blot. Each of each of these step, two major detection in terms of uh, antibody detection: chemiluminescence and fluorescent resin. Imaging resin blotting. Okay, you we will look at the X-ray film, the limitation X-ray film. And then the CCD camera, and also if you're doing fluorescent western as well, and the normalization of western blotting, two major uh, normalization method, housekeeping on total protein normalization. Right, so uh, we are also by system, so we have a range of western blotting reagents and imaging system. This is our Sapphire by American Imager and our also imaging system that can uh, fulfill your western blotting needs. So, in terms of chemi luminescence, we have Azu 300, which can you uh, you can do chemi detection here, and our highest spec is Azu 600. We had where you can do near infrared and RGB for us and chemi to get the in. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Kailing. Yeah, uh, one moment. I think your audio went off. Can you reconnect your your microphone? Uh, Kailing, Kailing, your sound uh, went off. I guess, I guess her her whole thing went off. She couldn't hear us either. So what 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 Dr. Kailing is trying to say on this field slide is yeah, 
So you can contact all of us here on the on the on the slides, and those are the products that you can um, you know get from Azure Bioassistance.